Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Benoit Deveau. I am the provost of Institut Polytechnique de Paris, and I have the pleasure today to welcome John Ioannidis uh, for this keynote lecture, which is uh, a keynote lecture of both the computer science uh, uh, laboratory and the uh, Centre Interdisciplinaire High Paris. Uh, John is a medical doctor uh, who, instead of staying into epidemiology, uh, moved towards statistics. And uh, he's, he's now a professor of epidemiology and population health at Stanford. And uh, his studies focus on reproducibility of uh, scientific studies. Uh, as, as you well know, his most famous article is why most published research are false. And as, as most of you, I was uh, thinking that first, this is a very strong statement. Uh, second, this must be false. I, I'm sorry, John, I'm, I'm a physicist. Uh, and basically, I'm trying to say that uh, everything that I've been publishing is checked and rechecked and verified. And this is not like in medical sciences where you, you guys make averages and so on. But so we, we, we check everything. And then uh, I thought and I remember that my first paper before, I, I was just a co-author, I was not the main author, but I was a co-author, and my first paper in physics, before starting my PhD, was just wrong. It, it, was, it was based on uh, a not properly uh, uh, understood figure. And, and for a very long time, this paper has been the most cited of my papers. Fortunately, now I have other papers that I think are right. They, they might be wrong, but I think are right, but, but uh, I, I think I've progressed. So, uh, uh, as once again, as a physicist, I think that most of what I've published is still right. But what John is telling us is that we should be very, very careful about uh, what we are publishing and the way people are thinking about our publication. I like the quote of uh, what John says, he says, citation matrix can be horribly unreliable. So citation matrix are important, but they may be wrong also. So it's not just because a paper has been highly cited that it's right. So with this, uh, I'm very happy that uh, John is going to give us uh, a lecture today on meta research, a quest for better I'm, I'm sorry, a quest for better science. And my main message before leaving the floor to Michaelis is: be skeptical, check the basis of everything you are reading. And with this, I leave the floor to Michaelis and then to John. And I'm awfully sorry I will be obliged to leave you and not able to attend the whole of the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Benoit, for this kind introduction and for the time that you devoted to this talk. Uh, we hope to be able to see you again soon. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so, it is my uh, great pleasure to, uh, and, and honor to welcome uh, Professor John Ioannidis today. I'd like to, uh, let's say, say a few words uh, on the general topic. Um, we are in Ecole Polytechnique in, uh, in Ipe Paris. We are working uh, in the area of research. And uh, what is research? Research is uh, trying uh, to find new patterns, to understand the data, to observe the nature at the macroscopic or at the microscopic level, to solve problems that exist. For instance, the most recent example was the vaccination that was produced in a really swift time for the COVID pandemic. And then uh, a very important uh, part of the research is to communicate the results. Uh, to communicate the results to the society, to the economy, to the government, and make it uh, productive and useful uh, for different reasons. 
Now, this is the big, the big, uh, the big image about research. Of course, uh, research is about, uh, I mean, there is epistemology that uh, talks about it, but usually we use uh, mathematical tools, uh, statistics, probability, optimization, uh, p-values, whatever. Uh, but of course, uh, all these mathematical tools, this is a rather personal opinion, but I think this uh, opinion grows is that uh, many tools have, uh, are full of assumptions uh, and axioms with uh, local validity. For instance, uh, two straight lines that seem parallel uh, in a small context may be uh, meeting a uh, few kilometers away, so, it, so they are not parallel. So um, we are based on, uh, on empirical observations on empirical observations um, that we organize uh, as experience grows. For instance, the medical science was based in my, uh, in my poor understanding uh, initially on empirical uh, knowledge, on observations uh, that doctors did to the, uh, to the people that had the diseases. On the other hand, uh, we have um, the nature that drives uh, our perception. For instance, uh, hundreds of years ago, Newton perceived the gravity law by looking, uh, the legend says, the apples falling from the trees. But recently, uh, we understand that gravity is not enough to interpret the universe. We have the gravitational waves that are indication of the existence of uh, um, dark energy and dark matter that constitute the vast majority of the universe, but we don't have the means to perceive it because we cannot see, we, cannot, uh, we don't have the tools uh, to directly perceive. So research is about seeking for uh, building models or functions that, uh, uh, that represent the data that we have at hand and in the best case can do predictions for the future. And Currently, we have a lot of data. Uh, we have an unprecedented um, amount of data that are being produced at different uh, levels, different sciences, different domains. Uh, we are working mostly in the area of uh, social media, behavioral data, um, social networks, where uh, we, with our motion, with our lives, with our preferences, with our queries, we produce an immense amount of data that is being recorded, uh, every single bit of them. And we, we are already uh, sure that uh, data is power. And uh, the one that has the data maintains a very big advantage. For instance, the big uh, software companies or other, uh, uh, or other industries that maintain the data, they have the processing power, they have the, uh, the algorithms. So, um, I advocate that uh, we need to let the data speak, that we need ways to extract from the data um, in, a, in, a, in a way that is unbiased from assumption. So the bias issue is, is important, and this is part of uh, what uh, Professor Ioannidis, I think, is going to talk to us about. Uh, it is very important that our experiments and that our, um, let's say, findings can be reproduced uh, so we are talking about reproducibility. This means that we open source our data, we open source our algorithms, and also, and most importantly, the experimental protocol and method so that everybody can reproduce and the experiments and the findings are uh, credible. Um, so this gave ground to, um, let's say, uh, uh, to the production of hundreds of thousands of papers in the last uh, Years, the number of papers uh, is, uh, some people say, exponentially increasing because of the huge investment that governments and companies do in the area of research at different levels. Um, and uh, these hundreds of thousands of papers that have uh, been uh, produced give rise to a huge uh, set of data that need to be investigated and we need to extract models um, from, from, this, uh, from this huge corpus of knowledge. Um, so the idea is that we need to perform analysis uh, without um, introducing bias, but also respecting heterogeneity. 
Um, so um, this is more or less, uh, in my understanding, the field of meta research. And Yanis Ioannidis, uh, Professor Yanis Ioannidis is a pioneer in this area, and not only in this area. So I'm going to say a few words on his bio, if he allows me. Uh, so Yanis Ioannidis was born in, New, in uh, New York, but was raised in Athens, Greece. So he's uh, Greek somehow. Um, as a child, he was uh, top in mathematics. He had distinctions uh, in dif at different levels in mathematics. He was valedictorian at one of the Greece's premier high schools, top of his class in the medical school of Athens. Then uh, he moved to the United States where he, uh, he attended the Harvard and then the Tufts University. And uh, he spent two years in the National Institute of Health uh, working uh, with Anthony Fauci, the well-known uh, epidemiologist that was responsible for the treatment, for the handling of the pandemic crisis in the US. And um, Professor Ioannidis helped run cl uh, clinical trials that led to, the, to breakthrough drugs for long-term treatment of HIV. Um, at uh, John Hopkins University, an important contribution to medicine, among others. Then, uh, based on his long experience on uh, uh, data, medical data, um, he published this uh, famous paper that was mentioned by Benoit before, why most published research findings are, are false, that was like a huge stone thrown in the lake of uh, science that created a lot of uh, perturbations and waves. Uh, and this paper uh, got more than three million hits in the public library of science. Uh, John Ioannidis is the top epidemiologist without any doubt in the world. And he has bold and articulated interventions uh, during the COVID period, um, uh, expressing um, uh, always uh, reasonable and uh, well-founded opinions. Uh, he's uh, one of the most cited scientists in the world, uh, more than 350,000 citations and an impressive index of more than 200, if we go to metrics. Uh, and he maintains uh, multiple uh, appointments in Stanford, among them uh, professor of medicine, epidemiology and population health, um, professor by courtesy of statistics in the School of Humanities. He, he co-directs the Meta Research Innovation Center at Stanford. He also maintains um, um, a, a visiting uh, Einstein Fellow position and director of the Meta Research Innovation Center in Berlin. Um, so he, he's, he, he has uh, multiple, uh, let's say, collaborations around the world. And uh, so he, uh, he has uh, received uh, numerous awards, just uh, uh, some of them. Uh, he has been inducted uh, in the Association of American Physicians, European Academy of Cancer Sciences, uh, the European Academy of Sciences and Arts, the US National Academy of Medicine, and the Academy of Sciences in Bologna. He has received honorary titles from the University of, of Ioannina in Greece and fourth as well in Greece. Uh, many uh, honorary doctorates, including universities of Amsterdam, Athens, Tilburg, Edinburgh. Um, but he is not only a top scientist. Uh, he, he has cultivated interests in literature and classical music. Um, uh, very, uh, very interestingly, not only he writes poems, he has published eight books uh, with poems in Greek, but he teaches as well a course at Stanford for Greek poetry and moonlights as an opera librettist. So Washington Post uh, wrote about him following the data and sometimes challenging with the headwinds of conventional wisdom or popular opinion. So with these few words, I welcome uh, John Ioannidis at the floor. Let's welcome him with a strong applause. Merci beaucoup, uh, Mihalis. Je suis très heureux de visiter l'école polytechnique uh, à Gem, Paris. Et cette lecture, le titre peut-être pourrait être euh, Meta Recherche euh, et à paraphrase de, de Proust euh, à la recherche de la science euh, perdue. Et, la lecture sera en, en anglais et pas en français, euh, pas en la langue euh, plus élégante du monde. Euh, 
en langue pli barbare, en anglais, mais euh, je crois qu'il y a certaines personnes qui euh, ne parlent français et, et euh, peut-être euh, euh, ce sera plus facile pour moi aussi. Alors, euh, some preemptive comments. Science is the best thing that can happen to humans. I have always trusted that. Science depends on trust. I said I have always trusted that. Trust depends on openness. It depends on sharing. It depends on replication, being able to see that something works again and again. But how much trust can we have? And can we calibrate trust? Can we reinforce trust? Here's some text mining that we did uh, along with my team, and we published these results recently in PLOS Biology. We looked at the entire open access universe of papers uh, in PubMed, mostly biomedical, but it does include papers from other disciplines. And this is millions of papers. Um, how many publications are sharing data over 30 years? You see lots of dark color. Very few share their raw data. So you have to believe that the data are OK. How many are having some register protocol that someone ahead of time um, said, here's my protocol, this is what I'm planning to do, I will place it somewhere for people to see, and now I'm doing the research and reporting the results. Again, lots of darkness all around the world. There's a little bit of color in, in Africa because uh, some research done by Europeans in collaboration with African researchers or with Americans in collaboration with African researchers has more transparency uh, in the research being done there. But otherwise, you see lots of dark color around the world. Very, very few papers do that. So meta research is trying to understand these issues of transparency, openness, and trust. And in the past, this would be like studying the scientific method and the way that we practice science. It would be a part of epistemology. It would have mostly theory or theories. It would have a lot of philosophy. But now we have a lot of data beyond theory, theories, and philosophy. We have about 200 million scholarly documents, mostly papers, but also books and preprints and uh, abstracts and conference proceedings that are floating around and are accumulating at a pace of about 10 more million per year and with geometric growth. We have massive availability of efforts to systematize the literature. We have millions of reviews, many of them systematic or claiming to be systematic. We have well over 100,000 meta-analysis. We have a lot of empirical evidence that can allow us to look empirically at how different research fields have done on different questions. And we can generate evidence on what factors are affecting the results that we generate, the results that we publish, the results that we use also for decision making, for making policy decisions, for, for building something for the community. Now, looking at that evidence does not mean necessarily that we will understand the true effects, the true associations, the true correlations, or whatever you want to call it, but at a minimum, it can tell us something about the biases that may be permeating different fields. So here comes reproducibility. Reproducibility is a term that has been widely used in the last uh, 10 years. There's a geometric increase in the use of this term across all 21 major scientific fields. This is uh, some text mining exercise that we did with my colleagues. And one wonders, well, what is reproducibility? What exactly do we mean that? And how are we going to say that a result is reproducible? Different fields have different claims and different needs for reproducibility. And uh, the fields would differ on all of these factors. They would differ on the degree of determinism that they wish to have, on what is the signal to measurement error ratio that exists in their field, what is the complexity of designs and measurement tools, what is the closeness of fit between hypothesis and experimental design and data, what kind of statistics or analytical methods we're throwing to the data to try to make sense? What is the typical heterogeneity of the results? And uh, when do we say, oh, that's very different? Or we say, well, that's expected to be different, and it's just what you expect in this kind of situation. Whether there's even a culture of replication, or people say, you're not going to waste my money, you're not going to waste my resources to just do the same thing again. This is me too, this is a waste, uh, just move on to the next target. Versus if you don't do that, then you're not a good scientist. I'm not going to put trust on what you have done. Where there's a culture of transparency, as I said, lots of darkness in most uh, places. Uh, culture of accumulating knowledge, 
whether people do want to put data together or just leave them alone on, on their single study level. What kind of statistical thresholds are used? First of all, are even statistical thresholds used? Uh, do people use frequencies methods? Do they use Bayesian methods? Uh, do they use p-values? Do they use p-values with cutoffs that are kind of magic uh, or have some rationale behind it? And finally, why are we doing this? What is the purpose of the research enterprise in a specific field? Is it curiosity driven alone? Is it applied? Uh, does it want to have some translation or perhaps in medicine save lives? We can summarize reproducibility into three big bins. Reproducibility of methods, reproducibility of results and of inferences. Reproducibility of methods is the fine print in the method section or somewhere in the appendix or supplement where people will read, um, well, can I put this thing to work again in my hands? I, I see what they have done, that other team. Can I read that section and try to, to make it alive in my own lab, in my own computer, in my own cloud or whatever? Reproducibility of results is I'm going to do a new study and I will try to be as faithful to the original one or maybe I will deviate a little bit or more than a little bit from the original one and I want to see whether I still get the same results or similar results or congruent results or consistent results with the original one. And inferences, I have one, two, fifty, five hundred, five thousand studies as many and I ask different scientists, what do you make of those? Uh, what is your conclusion? What is your inference? If it's for a decision, are you going to do it or not do it? Or what exactly are you going to do it? And people may decide differently looking at the very same evidence. Here's one example of a bird's eye view on a whole discipline. Does diet cause cancer? Uh, diet is something that uh, uh, I was thinking of an example that would be familiar to all of you. I mean, we all eat food and we all want to be healthy. So how would we know? Well, I opened a popular cookbook, the Boston cookbook. It has recipes uh, and it's published since the late 19th century. I randomly selected pages, randomly selected recipes, and then randomly selected ingredients and came up with 50 ingredients for then with those we went to the scientific literature and tried to see what studies had been done to see if these ingredients are related to cancer risk, increase cancer risk or decrease cancer risk. And 40 of them, they look like a poem, were associated with cancer risk. The other 10 we didn't find any studies, but it was mostly the way that we searched. So we searched for vanilla, which is not on the list. We didn't find any studies with vanilla and cancer risk, but if we had searched with vanillin, which is the biochemical ingredient, we would have found studies also for vanilla and, and vanillin. And, and these are the relative risks for these studies. Uh, if you focus at the bottom half, the top half is the location of the cancer. The bottom half is the type of ingredient. Most of these ingredients have had studies published that suggest increased risk and decreased risk. Some of them, the minority, are mostly on the bad side or on the good side. Um, I think one bacon is always on the bad side. But if you look at the magnitude of the effects, the relative risks are how many fold higher risk of cancer do you have if you have one more serving per day of whatever. The, the relative risks are completely implausible based on the best studies that we have with very meticulously measured uh, longitudinal cohorts, we know that bacon is probably not a good idea in terms of cancer risk, but you know, the, the risk is uh, 1.00 something uh, in relative scale, and you see that these relative risks are much, much bigger, either favorable or unfavorable, compared to these small effects that are likely to represent the truth. Now these studies, by their design, most of them are very small, so they would not have the power, even if there is an effect, to be able to detect that effect. So we would expect to have mostly non-statistically significant results for the vast majority of these studies. However, when you look at the z-scores, which is uh, taken from the normal distribution, the p-values transformed into z-scores, for these single studies, uh, you see the, the green distribution. Uh, um, there's a gap in the middle in the non-statistically significant range. And if you read the papers very carefully, you start filling in some of that gap with that gray zone material, which is uh, p-values of associations that are not discussed explicitly, but you can find them somewhere hidden in fine print or, or in some table. So what happens is that even though we would expect almost all that literature to be non-statistically significant, almost all of it is statistically significant. 
And if you try to put together studies with meta-analysis, you may start filling in some of the gap in the middle, but not much. Because if you have garbage in, you will get garbage out, uh, un unless you manage to get some really very well done studies. This is not just nutrition. This is a, an analysis that we did with uh, David Chaulariaz from uh, Institute of Complex Systems in Paris, uh, a very good friend and colleague of mine. We looked at the entire biomedical literature, the entire PubMed. Uh, at that time, it was about 15 million papers, and we had about a million papers that were also full text that we could uh, text mine. And we looked at p-values. If, if you had a p-value in the abstract, or if you had a p-value in the full text, 96% of the time, significant p-values would be included. So almost everything in the biomedical sciences claims some statistical significance. And uh, I would say this is a nuisance, because statistical significance was placed there by Fisher as a way to be able to filter out uh, noise and, and identify something that might be a bit of more interest. In, in a way, the beginnings of the frequentist and the Bayesian approaches, it was very much similar. You know, trying to filter and identify something that has a little bit more information, something to notice, something to pay more attention. And now everything is statistically significant. The proportion has gone down a little bit from 98% to 95%, but obviously this is not a big change. This is some work that I've done with uh, Dennis Sooks from uh, Cambridge, where we text mined um, uh, several tens of thousands of papers in, in different fields in neuroscience, psychology, and medicine. And the common denominator was that the power that these studies had was very limited uh, based on the sample size that uh, the studies had uh, for typical effects that may be lurking around, uh, these studies were tremendously underpowered. They would not be able to detect them. And if you have that situation, you're likely to have a very high chance of false negatives, but also even with the tiniest amount of bias, you would have a huge problem with false positives just as well. And um, this is one example from some other empirical data that uh, we generated with, uh, with Dennis uh, recently, uh, looking at the sample size and specifically neuroimaging studies. Um, you can see that they started with, a, with an average sample size of 4 to 5. They have moved up to 20, 25 by now. But neuroimaging uh, is a field that requires very dense measurements on very complex matrices of information. And uh, if you're trying to measure zillions of things and your sample size is just 4 or 5 or even 25, I, I think you're just going for a recipe for disaster. We've noticed the same problems in many domains. Across neuroscience, for example, we published that paper looking at preclinical research, basic research, clinical trials, animal studies. The common denominator was that the majority of studies were very small, therefore grossly underpowered, therefore very prone to both false negatives and false positives. And we've seen that in very different fields. This is a completely remote field. This is economics. Along with uh, Tom Stanley and Christo Culiagos, we have looked at all the meta-analysis on economics that we could put together. Uh, they include about uh, 70,000 effect estimates. And the common denominator was very similar to what we saw in neuroscience. The majority of studies were very small, underpowered, and most topics had practically only underpowered studies that were included in consideration. Increasingly, we have new opportunities. Um, many fields have been transformed, especially in the last 10, 15 years, with the availability of big data. Big data, sometimes they accumulate themselves while we are sleeping. I, I work uh, with uh, lots of big data and some types of da big data. For example, electronic health records, you go to sleep and next morning, there's another uh, 20,000 patients who have been included in the database that is still accumulating information. So th this is wonderful, but uh, from the very early days, I had lots of disappointments with, uh, with big data, in, in, at least in my hands. And then I started asking other colleagues and they also had disappointments. Uh, because they just have big noise most of the time. Uh, very rarely they're committed for research. They are just uh, being generated. And, and unless you know exactly how they're generated, who is generating them, why are they being generated, with what nomenclature they're being generated, with, with what rules or lack of rules, with, with what kind of quality of the variables that are being collected, I think one can get into very serious trouble. So several years ago, I wrote that paper with uh, my colleague, Muin Khoury, um, at science, uh, looking at the perspective from public health, but the same can apply to, to many other domains. Big data are a great improvement versus the small sample size problem that I showed you earlier, but it doesn't mean that we solve the problem. 
Then there's the interface between small data sets and big data sets. And here's one such interface. Genetics has been transformed from a field of mostly small studies in the past to a field of very large studies currently. And the new generation of very large studies has the extra advantage that not only the sample size has increased, but also the statistics have become better. We have far more rigorous statistics and, and rules and thresholds for claiming that we have discovered something. We have introduced replication as a sine qua non, so no one will believe me if I say I found a genetic risk factor unless I can see it again and again in several cohorts and several teams, and also in a meta-analysis of all the teams together. And also, um, since these are parts of international consortia of coalitions, there's no selective reporting. There's, or at least, there's no reason to believe that if I have 100 teams of investigators working together, they will cheat themselves to throw out four of them, you know, because they don't like the results and publish something that they know does not really fit the rest of the data. So when we had that transformation in that field, we could go back and test what we had found with tens of thousands of papers published in Nature and Science and the top medical journals and the top genetic journals in the past. The replication rate in this large scale reproducibility effort was 1.2%. 99% of what we had published was just wrong. Bird's eye views are possible and informative when you have multiple studies in a given topic. If you have a single study, you have to take it for what it is worth. You don't know um, if you were to try replication what other studies would show. But if you have multiple studies, then hopefully you also have meta-analysis, and meta-analysis has become very popular. Many people put lots of studies together on the same question. So along with uh, Dan Fanelli and Rodrigo Costas, we looked at uh, all fields of science. We selected up to about 300 meta-analysis in each field. We had uh, close to a quarter of uh, uh, a million studies included in this assessment. And we could try to see whether the pattern of results on the same or similar questions could fit to any of these 18 biases. For example, small study effects means that small studies give different results compared to large studies. Gray literature bias means that uh, a gray literature like PhD theses uh, uh, give different results compared to peer-reviewed papers. Decline effect uh, would mean that uh, someone publishes a paper that shows a very strong effect, a very clear finding, and then other studies show that well, maybe that's not so, maybe it's weaker, maybe it's not, not existing at all. Early extremes or Proteus phenomenon uh, means that you have a first study published in Nature claiming a huge effect, and then that creates a buzz, and lots of people say, that cannot be true, let me take a look. And someone then publishes within a very short period of time a counter study that shows exactly the opposite result. But then there's studies somewhere in the middle. So there's that opportunity window to refute something that is very prominent. And maybe the truth is somewhere between these two extremes. And, and so forth. Citation bias, whether American studies give different results, whether industry is influencing the results that we produce, um, whether countries, based on their policies, what kind of incentives they give, uh, uh, authors, uh, whether there's team control, other scientists kind of cross-checking members of, of the team. Uh, career level, gender, research integrity, and so forth. So we could test whether the patterns of the results were consistent with biases coming from these sources. And we could see most of these biases in most fields, but, but not always. For example, small study effects coming up to the introductory statement, they were very prominent in social sciences. They were prominent in biomedical sciences they didn't seem to exist in physics, you know, in physical sciences. Uh, you know, if, in physics, if you work with, with big telescope data, uh, you, you don't have a problem with small data sets. I mean, you have many other problems, perhaps, but uh, it doesn't really make sense that, you know, the small studies would give different results than, than big studies. However, in, in other fields, uh, physics may have a different pattern compared to social and biomedical sciences. And I would argue that for each scientific field, each subdiscipline, one has to try to understand what is the community doing and what do these research practices potentially translate to in terms of biases that may be influential. Sometimes it's not an issue that we're chasing our tail after completely false and completely null results. It may be that we're pursuing effects that exist, uh, associations that are real, but maybe we exaggerate. And this means that the effect sizes, uh, regression coefficients, uh, odds ratios, uh, correlation coefficients, whatever, 
are stronger than they really are in, in reality. And this is one example from the most highly cited papers in biomedicine on biomarkers. Biomarkers are, for example, proteins that can tell you something about the biological process and some clinical outcome. And I'm plotting for you the relative risk in the highly cited study on the horizontal axis and the relative risk in the larger study, not necessarily the best study, but at least the largest. You see, almost all the action is below the diagonal. The, the studies that lead the field, that drive the devotion of so many scientific teams in this area have very exaggerated effects compared to what the real effects might be. And we have seen that exaggeration again and again in many areas. There's a lot of literature that has been generated uh, both by my team and, and many other teams on tools to assess overestimation in different ways of uh, uh, overestimation that can happen. We can look at effect sizes in massive scale. We can look at what kind of effects are circulating across big scientific disciplines, for example. This is an assessment of 85,000 research topics in medicine. We used all the meta-analysis from the Cochrane Collaboration uh, database of systematic reviews and meta-analysis, and we could take a look what kind of effect sizes are floating around in medicine. Are there interventions that have very large benefits? And at face value, oh yes, there are a lot, about 10% have odd ratios more than five, which means that you do five times better if you get the treatment versus if you don't get the treatment. But almost always, when we had such huge effects, we could see that whenever someone did another study, the effect went away. It either completely disappeared or it became very, very much smaller. And why was that? Well, because these huge effects that we first saw in the first studies, they came from first studies with sample size of 12. You know, going back to the neuroimaging situation, with a sample size of 12, uh, 12 events. It, it's something that you cannot really put a lot of trust. It's most likely to be just a statistical error uh, and inflation by bias or, or even by chance when you're looking at hundreds of thousands of studies being done in medicine. We could zoom in also in single subdisciplines. For example, we could take a look at the entire field of emergency medicine and look at the distribution of effect sizes across 431 interventions that are used in emergency medicine and uh, data with uh, about 3,000 studies informing them. And we could see that they deviate from a purely normal distribution. So this is what you expect. You expect a normal distribution centered on null, nothing works, and maybe a subset of interventions that work that give you a tilt in the distribution. But then we could go and see, well, that extra bonus over the normal distribution, is it real? And we could start looking at biases. We could start looking at uh, what do these studies do? Do they do something that is correct or do they do something that has some fundamental quality flaws? And most of the time, they have fundamental quality flaws. Uh, this is a meta, meta, meta analysis where we looked at meta analysis in multiple fields and we tried to assess the impact of quality deficits. For example, if the randomization was not properly done. Uh, or if uh, there was no allocation concealment, if uh, there was a, a problem with double blinding. And, and we saw that there is a problem, that on average, if you have these problems, you tend to see inflated results compared to when you don't have these problems. The difficulty is that you cannot just say that I have that quality problem, so I will correct the results. Because you don't know whether the average correction would be fine for a specific question. It may be too much or it may be too little because there's quite a lot of variability across different fields. Research is becoming international. Recently, China overtook uh, the US, and I think it may have overtaken uh, Europe. I haven't checked the, the last year or so, but it was very close. It depends on how you define Europe with the UK now or without the UK um, or, or you know, Eastern Europe included. So do we trust research done in environments that are rising, that uh, have uh, new interest or also in environments that don't have a tradition of strong uh, research methods. And we can test that empirically. We can compare results of studies done and published in countries that don't have a strong research identity and others that are rising and others that have a more established research identity. And for example, when we did that, we saw that there were huge differences, even for mortality, which is the most difficult thing to bias. I mean, if, if, if someone is dead, that means really, you know, dead cannot be half dead. I mean, it's, uh, it's clear. Even for that, you can see effects that are related to the location where research is done. 
There's also fields that attract tremendous attention. The classic example was, was COVID-19. We had tremendous attention from scientists to work on COVID-19. A major crisis, a major pandemic, the, the top problem of interest. We recently published that paper where we looked at all the papers on COVID-19 that were indexed in Scopus until August 1st of this year. More than 200,000 papers and more than 720,000 different authors contributing to these papers. Currently, probably the number is above 1 million. And these scientists, they came from all fields of science. We are dividing science into 174 fields. And uh, obviously, in the beginning, you saw a lot of action in epidemiology, in virology, infectious diseases. But then everybody jumped on board. The, the last discipline to fall was automobile engineering. Uh, you know, December 2020, we had papers from automobile engineering experts published on COVID-19. This sounds great in terms of interdisciplinarity, trying to solve a major problem, but then the quality of that work was miserable. There's multiple empirical evaluations that show that most of that research uh, had major quality problems. Sometimes these problems were not caught even by the very best journals. Sometimes it was even fraud. And I'm not saying that most of these papers were fraudulent, but this is a very classic case, a paper that Lancet published in Fast Track. Uh, it claimed to have included 671 data sets from all over the world, and none of the institutions included had any clue about these data sets' existence. So, so the company who created these fake data just gave them to a Harvard professor, and the Harvard professor published the paper in Lancet, which is like one of the two top medical journals, uh, but it was all fake. We also know that um, lots of efforts just failed because the, the problems were intractable. And even if you had the best scientists, and we had so many scientists, you could not get very reliable results. So this is a, a paper that uh, we published in the International Journal of Forecasting, trying to understand why did we fail in our forecasting efforts. And, and the problems were problems that we knew in the pre-COVID era, but they became far more prominent in the COVID era. So we had poor data input on key features uh, that go into theory-based forecasting, poor data input for database forecasting, wrong assumptions, high sensitivity of the estimates, lack of incorporation of classic epidemiology, poor past evidence on the effects of available interventions, lack of transparency, just plain errors, lack of a de determinacy, looking at only one or a few dimensions of the problem at hand. These are all problems that we had to some extent noticed in the past, but now they coalesced. Lack of expertise in crucial disciplines, uh, groupthink, bandwagon effects, selective reporting, just cherry picking the nice looking results. And eventually, in, in such a difficult situation, uh, selective reporting, for example, can make a huge difference. Uh, this is a, a reanalysis that we did of uh, a, a very influential model by Imperial College, by some of the best scientists in the world, uh, where they estimated that early lockdown in Europe saved millions of lives. And they made that inference uh, using a model. They published that in Nature. So we looked at their model again. And we also looked at another model that they had published at the very same time and which they had applied to US data. But you know, the model could be applied just as well to, to European data. And we did that. And that second model showed that lockdown had absolutely no effect, no benefit. And when we looked at multiple data fit measures, you know, both Bayesian and others, the model that showed no benefit had much better fit to the data compared to the one that had been published. So you know, that team knew of both models, but the one that was most attractive was the one that claimed huge benefits, even though the, it was a model that didn't have good fit. If you have the raw data, you can go back and do reanalysis. Um, so you can probe whether the problems are in the reporting or even inherently in the studies themselves, the way that they're done. This is one early example, along with many colleagues working in microarrays. We got in touch with Nature Genetics, one of the early journals that uh, had adopted a practice of uh, sharing all the raw data and the protocols and the algorithms and the codes as a precondition to publication for microarray studies. So we tried to reanalyze 18 papers uh, that were published in Nature Genetics, and we could only do that for two to get the same results. In the other cases, the data were not available. The software uh, was homemade, and it had disappeared, was not available. The methods were unclear, so different macroarray specialists looked at them and just couldn't make sense. Or everything was clear, uh, and everything made sense, and the results could be recounted, recalculated, but they were very different. And 
we have done such exercises in many other fields. We have looked at randomized trials. We see the same problem in the past. Um, so lots of scientific fields have started going into some sort of soul searching. They have started questioning the trust that they were putting until now. One classic example is psychological sciences. 271 teams of psychologists join forces to try to reproduce 100 of their top-notch papers in their top-notch journals, and they could only reproduce one-third of them, roughly. I mean, you can define reproduction in different ways, so maybe a little more, a little less, but roughly two out of three fail to be reproduced. Then another effort looked at papers that had been published in Nature and Science. You know, maybe they're the best journals, and therefore we can put more trust in them. Not really better. You know, still, we had a 50% failure rate. Maybe we can just ask the experts, what do they think? And uh, you know, just uh, have them vote. Do you think that paper will reproduce? Uh, or even better, let them play with money, with real money, and invest like a stock market. You, know, you, you have a prediction market, and you invest on the papers that you think will be reproduced. If you are correct, then you get double the money or triple the money. If you fail, and, or you know, your, your placement is misguided, then you lose your money. They could do a little better than chance but not much, much better, and uh, obviously depends on the field how much private knowledge there may exist that is outside of the published scientific literature that everyone can use. You know, perhaps in the corridors people are talking, I've tried these experiments, they don't work, oh no, it, but it was in nature, no, 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 it doesn't work, I've tried that 10 times. In some fields maybe that private knowledge exists, in others we don't know. But existing or not existing, it means that this reproducibility quest also causes tension. Because people don't like to hear that, oh, your paper is wrong. All your papers are wrong. Ten of your papers are wrong. Uh, your whole field has 1% uh, <laughs> replication rate. That doesn't sound like a good message. And the, the first connotation is that, so you mean that I'm a bad scientist? No. I mean, if you work in a field that has 1% success, if 98% of your work is wrong, that, that's amazing. You know, you're, you're the best. You know, the average would be 1%. But it, it's, it's not easy for people to understand that. And therefore, we go in what I call reproducibility wars, that people are fighting to keep the literature as it is because it just carries their name. And that means that there's very strong resistance to refutation. We have seen when we did citation analysis of some of the most clearly refuted papers in biomedical science that they continue to be very heavily cited. And we've seen that again with some paper that we published recently with Tom Hardwick and colleagues uh, on psychological science. People continue to cite the entirely refuted work, either ignoring or seemingly ignoring the refutation papers, or mentioning the refutation papers but still making some plea that, well, the refutation papers did not really exactly do this and you know, it's still okay the, the way that we thought. We need more sharing to be able to do a more in-depth, real look into what we're doing. Some fields are already doing this. I told you about genetics. This is a paper that we published two years ago uh, many investigators in genetics said that for publicly funded genetics research, everything should be available in public, everything should be available for free, everything should be available for everyone to use even before the generating investigator who developed the data should be able to use it. Because if you have a single investigator trying to publish a paper based on a snapshot of information, that's going to be pretty unreliable. Well, if you have the community of all the evidence, the cumulative evidence being analyzed, that would lead us to something that is uh, more trustworthy. In other cases, it's more difficult. For example, psychology and psychiatry, along with Tom Hardwick, uh, we tried to reach out to the principal investigators, the corresponding authors of the most highly cited papers in psychology and psychiatry. And we tell them, please send us the raw data from your studies. These are extremely influential studies. They're driving psychology and psychiatry at large. And we will make them free. We will curate them for you. We want no money. We will do it for, for no cost. And everyone would be able to to use that information. We didn't get that much. We, we, there were some studies that were already available, but most uh, did not contribute further information. And um, most of the time, the problem was that the data were outside of researchers' control. Most of the time, it was studies that some industry, for example, some company con controlled. And the biostatisticians had analyzed them, had given them to the principal investigator. The put, principal investigator put trust on what he got, but he had not seen the data. Medical journals, uh, the top journals, are asking for a sharing plan for all the clinical trials that they publish. So we looked at the top medical journals to see what their sharing plans say and whether they do share the data. And 500 trials worth of information 
Most of them, they had sharing plans to share the data. But if you started going, well, do they actually tell us where? Do they actually tell us when? Do they actually have it right now? At the end of the day, only two data sets out of 500 were available to use right now if someone wanted to use them. The worst that can happen to trust is to be eroded to such a point that you don't believe anything that you read. And I don't want you to get to that point, but I think that John Carlyle, an editor in Anesthesia, uh, probably has been tempted. Over many years, in all the papers that he was getting, or most of them, he was asking the authors to send to him from clinical trials the raw data. And he would look at the raw data. And about 30% of the time, he would say, these data are impossible. They cannot happen. It, it was so obvious that the, the data were fake, fraudulent, wrong, wh whatever you want to call it. He called them zombie. So zombie trials. And when he published his experience, I wrote an editorial. And uh, it, it came out on a Halloween last year. Uh, and I, I estimated, based on his figures, that about 200 to half a 200,000 to half a million zombie trials are floating around us, hmm? uh, like in our everyday literature. How can you tell about those? Well, if you get the data, you can tell. And we asked authors at BMJ and PLOS Medicine that not only have explicit policies, but they do say you need to share the data. 46% of them did share the data. That's half full. And we reanalyzed all these data sets, we got the same conclusions. We, we got a little bit different results with Florian Odette, who ran the reanalysis, but nothing that seriously challenged the conclusion. So if you have a, an environment of transparency, probably you can put back much of the trust that has been lost. Where do we stand, though? These are some random surveys that we've done for the entire biomedical literature, and we saw that most of the time, very little is shared. We repeated that survey more recently, and we saw some action for data sharing, a little bit less for code sharing. And we repeated the survey in large scale, looking at uh, several millions of papers in the open access uh, PubMed. Um, so this is how it looks like. We've gone up from 0% or almost 0% to like 20% for data sharing. One out of five papers shares raw data. Much less action for code sharing. We're still down to like 1%, 2% at most. Um, very little protocol registration. Pretty good disclosures of conflicts of interest and funding, uh, although you don't know whether they're complete and accurate. Most people claim that they have something novel to say, even though most of what we read is really not novel. Everybody knows that. And very few people, but increasing, are saying that I'm trying to replicate something. Uh, this is another view of uh, the same data. You see that code sharing is just 1.2%, protocol registration 2.6%, uh, data sharing more, and it's rising. And uh, hopefully, we will get better. But um, it's not certain, because we may see some saturation effects. These are some maps of science that divide science into half a million sub-sub-disciplines. And if you see color, it means that that research practice is adopted in that particular field. And as you see, these research practices tend to be heavy in some sub-disciplines of science, but not in others. So maybe we're reaching a point where some sub-disciplines will be very open, very transparent. Everybody will agree that, well, we need to move forward with openness. And others will remain very closed and very non-transparent. Also, when we look at journals across science, we see some journals that most of their papers adopt openness, sharing transparency, uh, sharing data, and sharing code. But these are the exception. Most are sharing nothing. So the question is, how can we move the non-compliers to share more? Well. We need more, more meta-research. Um, you need to have me back. Uh, <laughs> I can give you some more optimistic uh, uh, method, message perhaps next time. And we need to re-engineer our reward system. We need to reward people who do the right thing. And productivity is one aspect of what we do. And I have nothing against productivity. I love people who are productive. I write papers like crazy. I'm sure most of them are wrong, but I do my best. But there's also quality, there's reproducibility, there's sharing, and there's translational potential for those who do applied research. Does it work? Does it achieve some goal? Does it change society uh, or, or some task? Do universities and research institutes follow these sets of criteria, this PQRST? Not really. Uh, among uh, 100 universities that we looked at, uh, looking at the medical school faculties with David Moher and his team, we saw that there was very little attention to these new progressive ways of assessing uh, one's work and rewarding uh, such work. 
Uh, most of the criteria were pretty traditional criteria of productivity, and very little was these new openness and transparency aspects. To conclude, um, we have tons of scientific information. We have 200 million scholarly articles, large numbers of systematic reviews, lots of meta-analysis, lots of crazy meta-researchers like me looking at the data now. Um, increasingly, we have more old data also, which, which is fascinating for those who want to play with data. Caveats of study design, of poor research, of poor reporting, they apply to meta-research as well, so you need to be very cautious. But the discipline is relatively new, which means a thing that there's still a lot of low-hanging fruit, like big patterns to be discovered. For, for those of you who are in the, the data mining and uh, exploring data sets, there's big signals to be discovered. Bias is still possible, nevertheless, and I would like to see more meta-researchers, more researchers and meta-researchers, and I have to say, I believe these are the same. They're not two separate communities. All researchers are meta-researchers to some extent, and, and vice versa. Try to look at these questions and try to improve our research practices. With special thanks to a number of my colleagues who uh, generated ideas, helped and contributed to some of the work that I showed and shared with you today. And with extra thanks to all of you for being here today. Thank you.